But I would like to invite our panel up on stage, starting with Sir Nigel Wilson, who's the, the Chief Executive of Legal in General. Nigel, do come and join me. Jamshed Godred, where's Jamshed over there, um, who is the Managing Director of Godred and Boyce and one of the advisory board members of the Smith School, uh, Professor Metamorsing, the new incoming director of the Smith School, and Ben Remington, the Director General uh, in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. And what we're trying to achieve with this session, um, and I will join them too, um, is to take stock of where we are internationally and nationally at this particular point in time. Obviously, we're still in the middle of a war. In fact, there are many, many wars going on, not just one. One gets all the, the headlines. We're in a situation where oil consumption is still rising, over 100 million barrels a day. Prices are still high. Uh, and we have geopolitical tensions in a fragmenting world that you know, the question is, will this help or hinder the transition to net zero? And so what I'd like to kind of extract from the brains that we have here is a sense, what does all this mean? Where are the big questions and how can we make progress and how can we find those synergies in a world that is changing? And we're not having long presentations, happily. Uh, we're going to have a, a chat and then have a very broad chat. So get your questions in mind uh, as we're going through this. So Nigel, I wanted to start with you, if it's OK. You have a perspective on the world with the 1.5 trillion assets that Legal and General has you know, in your command that is pretty unique and special. You see an awful lot of things going on. I enjoyed speaking to you about what you've been seeing the other day. Do you think we're going to make it? And, and what do we need to do to get there? Uh, at the moment, I think not make it would be my governing thought. I, I think we, we need to start uh, producing KPIs at a country level and a global level. The reason we don't produce any right now is that we know that we'd find, fall behind them very quickly. And that's really what's happening right now. I think consumer behavior is not changing very much at all across the, across the world. And we're not striving hard enough to change, to change that. Industry is not changing fast enough, I think, anywhere in the world uh, right, right now. There's lots of virtue signaling going on and lots of anecdotal evidence that we're making some minor amounts of progress. And policymakers are simply not bold enough. And we all know, and you made the comments at, during it, that um, emissions are rising, oil consumption's growing. And we talked about the difference between the forecasts that we see is that the, um, the transition to new net zero team think by 2045 will be down to 20 to 40 million barrels a day. OPEC, OPEC think that that will be 110 million barrels mm -hmm. a day. And the delta is, is enormous between the different pools of experts. There's no convergence around that. Yes, we've seen some progress on EV cars and solar uh, in particular. But we could do so much more, so much more quickly around, around that. And it's, it's odd that in 24 hours, the Prime Minister says one thing and Nissan say totally the opposite thing, that they'd like to get to EV production by 2030. And the Prime Minister said, saying, don't. I think the complex projects like carbon capture, hydrogen, nuclear fission, which Oxford is heavily involved in, some amazing IP, we're just going too slowly. And the costs of doing all of those projects are just too high. And it's the, the difficult and projects as well, with the, the hard to debate industries, which we've been talking about for more than a, dec a decade, we're simply not moving fast enough. And you were talking about synergies, actually. The synergies that are being produced are actually by some of the big oil producers who are actually uh, increasing the amount of solar usage in their own domestic economies. And America's doing that in Texas, Kuwait, Saudi have got massive solar farms. That produces is a substitute for oil in their own country uh -huh. and allows them to export more to the rest of the world, which is a really bizarre outcome. And that's, a, you know, there's clever people, but it, it is a synergy if that was the right solution. But sadly, it's not the right solution. We know from... Um, that China and USA are not making enough progress, and the behavioral changes are, are minor uh, there. Um, we don't have the people skills, and we're looking for synergies. You know, we want people to make higher amounts of money, real wages to go up, and 
you know, productivity has flatlined in the UK for 15 years. Real wages have gone down over those 15 years. And I'd use retrofitting housing as something, uh, or retrofitting buildings in general, as a, as a, as a good example. You know, we've got 26 million homes in Britain that need retrofitting. And if we did 1 million a year, and the average spend was somewhere between 7 and 20,000, that's, a, that's a, up to a, you know, it's, that is a huge, huge industry. It's you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 billion per year, which would transform G GDP. But we don't have the skills and we don't have the, the political will to, to build that industry, but it can be done in a heartbeat. You know, you know solar panels are super cheap and uh, insulation is super cheap. And, it, and we, could, we could easily introduce the first charge on properties, give them a loan, have that as the highest, and use the energy savings to pay back the interest on the loan. It's a it's been trialed at other places in the world, but we, we need these radical changes because um, it, it won't happen. And there's really no real political will. There's, you know, and that may extend to the electorate as well. Yes, everyone wants to see things happen, but as long as it's not them having to change their, their behaviour. And the, the planning for the national grid is a great example of that. We all know the national grid is, it plays a key role in the electrification of of Britain. And the same is true pretty much everywhere in the world, but we're not building out grid capacity anywhere in the world f fast enough. And my last point, which is really echoing a point that Irene made, is during COVID, which was a crisis, the scientists, and the technologists, people listened to them. And mRNA and um, the capabilities Oxford had been around for a long time. And we literally solved the problem in weekends and it transformed and happened in weekends. We have the capability to make massive progress, and you and I were talking about it earlier today, but we won't until there's a crisis because everyone is still in their comfort zone and actually plenty of virtue signaling, lots of pledging going on, but actually not the massive change that's really required mm -hmm. to combat all of the disastrous things that are going on in the world. Just look at the insurance industry. Some areas, <coughs> premiums are going up not by five or 10 or 15%, by 300% mm. as a consequence of climate change. So this is, this is happening, the crisis is emerging, but actually I, I think we won't respond enough until the crisis actually happens. I'm, I'm tempted to ask you, Nigel, how you respond when people say, you're so unrealistically optimistic. <laughs> uh, but, but I won't do that. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's nice to have a reality check and to look at the world how it is uh, and then to ask ourselves, okay, we know we need to go five times faster. Um, and, you know, current trends, we're not doing it. But let's ask ourselves the question, how do we do it? What is required? As in the, you know, the case with the pandemic, we were all told, I'm, as members of the public, I certainly remember hearing, well, it, we can't make a vaccine that quickly. It's not possible. It'll be years. And then a certain university with a certain department said, yeah, yes, we can, and we did. And I think you're right that that, that sort of can-do attitude in a crisis is where we need to get to, but you're also right that we're not there yet. Now, nobody, I think, would want to manufacture a crisis, but perhaps part of the challenge is to see a little bit further long-term than we are at the moment and realise that while the crisis doesn't appear to be upon us, is, is, is in fact upon us. And of course, if you're living in Pakistan, a third of the country's underwater, the crisis is, is upon you. Now, of course, um, Pakistan is a neighboring country of yours, Jamshed. And I'm wondering how, uh, how you react both to Nigel's uh, painting of the world that we're in, which was, um, in a sense, bleak, but, but I think realistic, and how you see the chess pieces moving internationally in a way that might be helpful or harmful to this agenda, to the environmental agenda. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I do re recognize what uh, you was saying, that I think we, we have to be optimistic, but at the same time, realistic. Uh, I think for a developing country like India, the India was always a laggard on climate policy, uh, <clears throat> partly because I think the, the government felt that, you know, on a per capita basis, you know, we are very, very low emissions. But India is a big country with a big population, and our total emissions are third or fourth in the world today. So we, we have to be uh, 
interested in moving that needle forward. And the reason why I think countries like India and, and other developing countries uh, need to be much more uh, cognizant of what's happening is because I think uh, we are going to be you know, deeply affected by what happens uh, with the climate. Now, whether it's to do with droughts or floods, I mean, food production can be disrupted. Uh, you mentioned the floods in Pakistan. Uh, I think uh, for a developing country like Pakistan, that's devastating. Mm. And, uh, but I, I must say, I come from industry, uh, a manufacturing industry. I think manufacturing industry has been very concerned about energy costs over a long period of time. And India always had very high energy costs for industry because it essentially subsidized everything else, especially agriculture. Mm. So there was a great incentive uh, for industry to, to do things to reduce energy consumption. And uh, one good example of that is the cement industry. You know, the cement, as we all know, it's one of those hard to abate and big uh, consumer of uh, energy. Uh, you know, the cement industry actually came together, worked with uh, organizations like the Confederation of Indian Industry, etc. Uh, and today, the cement industry in India, on an average, has the best energy consumption per ton of cement in the world. And that's happened only because of the high cost of energy. So you see the opportunity that was there, that you know here was a, a situation where we were. So I, I see this happening in India, this type of uh, change happening in developing countries, specifically because we have a lot to catch up to. You know, we have a large economy, large population, uh, big threats uh, all the time. But I think that the interventions that we have uh, and must really work towards, uh, you know, both raising our economy. I mean, we are growing at six, seven percent uh, annually. Uh, but what is happening as a result of that is the energy demand has increased so much, mm. and countries like India are not keep be able to keep up with renewables. So, in a sense, we are moving ahead, but we are falling backwards a bit also. Mm. Uh, so. There are huge challenges you know, in developing countries. And the way some economists and forecasters see the world developing over the next 27 years to 2050 is that India, because of its demographics and its position within the developmental progress uh, ladder, is that it will be potentially a bigger economy than China by the time we're hitting net zero, a potentially bigger force than China. We could have an argument about whether that's true or not. Um, China has been, in many respects, a useful actor on climate, in the same way that it's been a harmful actor in, in emissions. It's been very helpful in reducing costs. How do you see India's contribution over the next 20 years at, as it perhaps takes the, the mantle of the world's largest economy? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if you look at policy in India for development, it was not export-led growth which is very much the case with China and the rest of Southeast Asia. And uh, they have benefited enormously through you know, globalization and export-led growth. India, uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, didn't go that way. You know, we, we looked at ourselves as a large continental economy with a large population, plenty of consumers, and you know, this was not something that... Uh, but I think policymakers seem to understand now that you, know, you cannot divorce yourself from the way the world is moving, especially on globalization. So there are, of course, threats to globalization, but my point really is that you know, India's, even though we are growing today at 6 7%, China grew for three decades at over 10%. Hmm. You know? And their economy is at least three to four times our size. Hmm. And depends on the item you talk about. In some cases, they are 10 times our size. So, it's quite possible, you know, that with cause of demographics, you know, India growing, becoming such a large, China reducing its population, that over this period by 2070s, what our government have committed on for net zero, that India would be close or close to China. I mean, it could, I think 
we would definitely be you know amongst the two top economies mm. but whether we will overtake china depends a lot on you know what happens in china what happens in india right. on policy so it's it's very difficult over 50 years to really take a view on that great thank you so one of the things i want to dig into in this panel is how we you know nigel's laid out what is a realistically i would say pessimistic scenario in a sense of, of where we are not saying that we can't get there but saying that we're not on the way there and surely one of the levers for making progress is changing the way people think and certainly the smith school that's why we do a lot of what we do it's changing the ideas and it's then educating on mass and educating the elite as well and our incoming director knows a thing or two about education, having just led the UN's Global Compact on the Principles for Responsible Management Education. And Meta, I would just love you to share your thoughts on whether we can bridge this gap, the fact that we're doing this and we need to be doing this. Is education, I mean, obviously we all think it's central, but could it be decisive in moving the needle? Or is it the usual policy sort of interventions that doubtless will come on to with Ben? Meta. Thank you for asking such a great question, Cameron. Yes, um, indeed, and thank you for, for having me on this, uh, on this panel uh, here today. Uh, for the past uh, three and a half years, I've been leading, uh, as you've already said, the United Nations Global Compact uh, initiative on the private sector. More than 20,000 businesses signing up to engage with the sustainable development goals. And part of that arm is the arm for higher education that I was leading over three and a half years. And I've been traveling a lot, talking to a lot of these executive directors in Global Compact, working with businesses around the world. And I'll pick up on what you said, Nigel, about the skill set, because that's what I hear ongoingly. We lack the skills. We cannot recruit the talent we need in our businesses and in our governments, by the way, to address uh, the climate ch challenges that we are facing. We do not have the skills. And of course, that puts a huge responsibility back on us as educators, as universities, and in universities, the business schools as well, and how we engage with educating the future generation of leaders, no matter what discipline they come from. And I just want to remind you uh, about the number, which is 220. 220 million students are educated and given a degree uh, from higher education institutions every year around the world. 220 million. So that's a lot of young people and older people that we educate. Uh, and one third of them, 33% of the, uh, the 220 million, about, about 70 million students, they come out of schools of business, management, law, or economics. So one third of all these students that we give a degree every year, 70, 70, 70 million students, they come out with a, with a focus on what we're speaking about here today. So it matters what we bring into those classrooms. The theories, the frameworks, the concepts, the way of thinking, you could even say the mindset that we bring in as educators matters. And I can just say, and I, I, you know, I, would, I love to be optimistic, I think that I am a very optimistic person, but when I look upon the curricula, it, what is being brought into those classrooms, it is not a, an optimistic scenario. And why is that not happening? Why are, we not, why are we still bringing in a kind of, if I speak, for example, in the um, leadership education, in the management, in the business schools, uh, it's still a shareholder uh, maximization, it is still a short-termism. It is still a profit max maximization. This is chapter one in the strategy textbook, in the finance curriculum, in the accounting curriculum. It's still that mindset that prevails. So I'm not uh, surprised that the world is still on fire, even though we have the technologies. Some even say we have the finances. Uh, but we don't have the will, the skills, as you say, Nigel, you know, the, the skills to actually make the right decisions. So I think that one in three uh, coming out of our institutions of 70 million students is something that we really need to focus on. And it, it matters if it's our undergraduate, it matters if it's our one year or maybe our two year master programs that, where we actually um, do this. And I can say that for the Smith School, and I, I'm, I'm very proud that I can say that we have um, more than 1,000 students actually applying for our Master of Science in Sustainability 
and uh, we are, of course, proud that we can accept 29 of them. But there's still a huge demand from our students as well, as you can see. So businesses are asking for it, our students are asking for it. Uh, so now I think it's up to us to, to deliver. Thank you very much. So I, I obviously uh, heartily endorse that sentiment. I'm just, I was reflecting, before we come to you, Ben, that um, we responded to COVID, which was a crisis, with an all-out effort that um, you know, arguably was successful. Okay, some would say the vaccine equality was a bit of a failure, etc. But you know, we delivered the goods in terms of the technological response. Nigel, we've heard you say we don't have the skills. Meta, we've just heard you say that actually we don't even have the right framings in our education system. Does this mean we're not equipped to respond when we do finally decide that it's a crisis? Or do you think that we can skill up the hundreds of thousands? I mean, it's a question, in a sense, to, to both of you in the speed of time, in the, in the time available. You know, it, it, let's suppose we go forward another five years with inadequate action, and then finally the world wakes up and decides, actually, we've got to do this now. Mm. And we've got five years to deliver N million or billion heat pumps, et cetera, and engineers and the rest of it. Can we do it? I'll say just one quick uh, part of the response here. I think, of course, we can do it. And I think we need to, and it is already happening, uh, but not fast enough. I think that the, remember, remember who's actually educating our students, that's us. So uh, the research that we do, the research we engage in, the more you could sort of say climate oriented that is, uh, the upskilling of ourselves and also our research, which is what we bring into the classroom, the better. So I think that that research link is very, very important for the kind of education that we bring to our students. Mm -hmm. So of course, of course we can do it. And Nigel? Yeah, I'll give, give a practical example of it. Um, and it, it, it's an interesting thing about our over-optimistic behavioral uh, scenarios is when Russia invaded Ukraine, the Russian troops were all parked on the border. Putin had written a speech saying, I'm going to replicate the success of Catherine the Great. And most of us thought he still wasn't going to invade Ukraine. Even Cameron and, and Blair thought that. Germany, for many, many years, had resisted uh, having LNG facilities in Germany and building new capacity. Thought it was going to cost them a huge amount of money and take five to six years. Mm -hmm. During a stress and the crisis, when there was an energy crisis, they did it in four months. Mm -hmm. And that shows the ingenuity that we have, but we need to have the crisis to mm -hmm. really make it happen. And that's a, a good behavioral outcome. And you know, I think Pakistan is, is to a certain extent the same. Some of the you know, glacial melting that's going on there is catastrophic uh, on a human scale, not just an economic scale. And that, but we need those, sadly, those events have to happen for the for human beings to actually work together in a much more collaborative, collective way to deliver better, better outcomes. And there's so many situations that are brewing like that right now that I'm optimistic that we'll get to a crisis and then we'll respond well, but it's not actually the right solution that we, ha we, we have. I'm naturally an optimistic person too. But I'm, a, I'm enjoying your brand of optimism, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> so you can come back any time. Um, and I'm sure there are people here who would be thinking, well, we, I mean, what, how much crisis do you need? Uh, let's look around the world at fires, at floods, at droughts, at you know, perhaps food shortages, but maybe, maybe we'll, well, we probably will have more, and at some point, Nigel, your crisis threshold will be exceed in, and, and we hope at that point we get the same sort of response as we had to, to COVID, which is collaboratively, a collaborative and supportive, and not the sort of responses that I get when I play games with my master's students that place them under this sort of pressure. Um, but Ben, thank you very much for, for joining us today and for stepping up. Um, the, I, I want to talk to you about some very important questions, which is that as we make, as governments try and make progress on net zero around the world, they have to take their populations yep. with them. And we've seen that in one country after the next. And in a sense, what we saw last week was the prime minister of this country say, preemptively, we're not taking the public with us yet. They're going to push back. They're going to, and I'm gonna preempt the chaos, uh, not his language, of course, I'm paraphrasing. And I'm just gonna delay things, you know, just a bit. How, I mean, I'd like you to reflect on this in whatever form you wish to reflect on it. You're a senior civil servant. <laughs> I'm not going to make your life painful. Uh, okay. uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I won't go for interpretive dance, if that's okay. <laughs> um, 
So, um, so first of all, hello, uh, great to be here. I'm Ben Remington, I'm the Director General for Net Zero Buildings and Industry. So for once in a sole service, a job title that tells you broadly what I'm supposed to do in charge of decarbonising those bits of the economy. I should say, as a proud Yorkshireman, it's great to be in a college named after St Hilda of Whitby, uh, the fine Yorkshire town. Um, the, uh, it's certainly been an interesting uh, couple of weeks hmm. in government. Um, and uh, in the context of a discussion around synergies, I think it's actually quite an apposite time. Because what you're talking here about, uh, there is, I think, widespread understanding of the need to do something is, is it can be taken for granted. Right. Yeah. But the discussion just now about crisis and human response reflects that fundamentally this is a huge challenge to the human species mm. because of the way we've evolved and we've set up all our socioeconomic structures over eons. Um, and, um, I mean, what the Prime Minister was doing last week was that genuinely trying to level with people and to remove kind of naive thinking that it was relatively simple to legislate and make things happen just by legislating in some areas. Um, and that actually you do need proper sense of synergy with individual people's lives mm. if you're going to affect this transition, which is going to need commitment for everybody. Yeah? So I think there was a genuine um, honesty in what he was trying to do. The other thing I should say, because I mean... Um, there were some significant changes of direction in what he said last week, but one should not. There's been a bit of hyperbole as well, yeah? Because yeah? I, I won't repeat all the stuff about how great the UK's been over the last 20 years. You can leave that up, take that for granted. Um, but the, um, uh, you know, he made a shift on uh, uh, electric cars, which is actually not that significant a change and just takes the UK back to the European mainstream, frankly. Um, and a shift around home heating, which is significant, don't get me wrong, and is very much part of my job to work through where we go from here. Um, but alongside everything else that's happening on the UK net zero transition and all the investment and all, there's over 100 work streams that my colleagues monitor, and we've got cost and um, uh, quantified reductions way out to 2037, which is, you know, stands up to very good international scrutiny. So don't, the, the, the thing is, obviously, for political reasons, he spoke about things that are very politically apposite and attract media headlines. Mm -hmm. But in the context of policy thinking, we shouldn't overdo that in terms of its importance. But it's not unimportant. And the key here is that um, uh, in, it, you know, we've got the, basically the, the, the species and societal challenge of climate change hitting the realities of Western democracy. And this is a very clear case in point. And he's absolutely right. In the end, you have to take people with you. Because mm. even if you legislate, we've seen it in various contexts, if you legislate, if you haven't taken the people with you to the legislation, in the end, it falls apart. So he has got a point on that. But the, the real challenge we face is making sure that we line up all the incentives in the right way. Mm. So he made us, you know, we increased the grants we're giving people for heat pumps very significantly. That is a significant step forward. But I think not just for consumers, but for industry, all parts of society. We need to line the economic incentives up as a package across the world in a way that's going to enable us to make this transition at the pace we need to make it. And that's the great big challenge. So one of the key challenges for us going forward is the way we price energy in the UK, which for various historical reasons, the price of electricity is a lot higher than gas. Mm -hmm. And that's the opposite of where we want it to be. Uh, so we, this year we are going to start on, we're going to come for, as Chris, um, uh, as the... Uh, we committed in the, the Powering Up Britain strategy. We are going to bring forward proposals about the approach the government would take across that agenda, but we've got to start making progress there. Um, but I'm, I'm not a pessimist, and I think all these young people that we are educating, I mean, that's a challenge, but also an amazing opportunity, right? Um, but we haven't got much time if we're going to have this comprehensive engineering throughout the economic, and, and it's not just the kind of, as it were, the financial economics, it's the behavioural economics as well. This is really important. You all know better than I. Because as a private individual, you can line things up such that you should make economically rationally, you should make a decision, for instance, to do things to your heating system. Um, but we need the, it needs to be what people like me are doing, which takes you back to your young people and taking it out into society and um, into that, that wider context. Yeah, I mean, I guess the way you're putting it, and I think probably Nigel would agree, is that we want to make our policies robust to the self-interest and perhaps yeah. the ignorance of the general population at yeah. large so that they are making decisions that deliver good collective outcomes, good environmental outcomes, irrespective of whether they care about the environment or not. I guess just one quick follow-up, though, because I'm sure there are plenty of people here thinking, well, how does pushing back the EV deadline from 2030 to 20? 35 help uh, people, given that most of the analysis, including by the CC and others, 
suggests that actually it's going to increase costs uh, for the average household. And do we, what is, it, it, maybe Desnes doesn't kind of accept those numbers, or, or is there an issue here with what people perceive to be the costs that they're facing, and not actually the costs that they're facing? And they're much more concerned with the upfront sticker price and less concerned with the sort of CCC numbers, which are yeah. total cost of ownership. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure my line on the numbers is we don't necessarily recognise those numbers. That's what we always say when we win numbers. <laughs> there are down numbers. Um, uh, I think you're right. It, it's about my point about you know um, uh, money economics and behavioural economics. Yeah. Mm. And where do people sense value and sense cost? And people aren't very good at thinking about overall lifetime cost of ownership right. of an asset. Yeah. So um, people focus very much on uh, you say cars, but I can say heat pumps and the difference in the upfront cost. That's important. But actually, the lifetime running cost is more important overall in terms of how much money you're going to spend as an individual. So um, there is a point there about helping people through that reasoning. Mm. Um, but it also means that for politicians, they do have to respond to that perception of the upfront cost, yeah. which is why you end up, I think, where you do on the, on the EVs position the Prime Minister has over last week. I personally love to dig into this a lot more, but Nigel, <laughs> I can tell, is very keen to... Yeah, I mean, I was in China a few weeks ago. I got driven around by an AI vehicle for 45 minutes with just me in the car, and they've sectioned off 100 square kilometres. They're testing all their EV vehicles. There's 600 in the test across m multiple different manufacturers, and they've decided we have an industrial strategy. Our strategy is to be the world leader in e EV production and manufacturing. They're already the world's largest exporter, we made it, it a non-decision many years ago not to build any car battery factories, which is a real competitive disadvantage as a, as a nation. And as a follow-on consequence of that, we can't then transfer to EV production, even though the biggest car manufacturer in the UK, which is Nissan, is building the only car battery factory right beside its factory in, in Gateshead. And it's seen its production at that plant go from 500,000 to 250. 250,000, and our danger is we lose industries because we make a, the wrong short-term decision on these sorts of situations. And I'm a huge admirer of Rishi. I think he's a really clever guy, and he really understands the detail much more than, I'd say, some of the previous holders of that position <laughs> over a very long period of time. I um, but, you know, you have the, the fact that we, we didn't recognise we have an oncoming crisis in the automobile industry results in us making suboptimal decisions later on, and it's a really, really poor outcome. And we'll probably get reversed if the Labour Party gets in, the Labour government gets in. That makes foreign investment really unsure and domestic investment really unsure. So the unintended consequences of that can be very severe for, for us both as an economy, but also for the specific industry. And do you think, in fact, this is open, open kind of slather now, you can all pile in, um, but are we moving to a world where actually much stronger industrial strategy by the state or states around the world is going to be necessary? I mean, in the UK case, um, I'm imagining what my colleagues uh, in the civil service would say, we saw this coming, we built the Faraday Institution, we skilled up and, and, and built the kind of underlying science base for EVs and for batteries. We just couldn't quite, we hadn't, didn't quite make it work for reasons, a bunch of reasons about international competitors. But, you know, we saw it coming and we've recognised, right, right of centre, conservative governments have recognised the need for an industrial strategy. Do you think that's going to be shared around the world on climate issues? Jamshid, you're nodding. Yeah. No, it will definitely. Uh... I mean, it's, I mean, from my own experience, I know how easy it is, you know, just to buy from China or somewhere, uh, as opposed to saying that, you know, we will build it and build it better and cheaper in India, mm. you know. So I think the industrial policy helps you get that moving. And uh, we have a scheme very similar. Uh, it's called a production-linked incentive. Uh, scheme, which is covering a fair amount of industry today. And you can see that the investments are coming in for things that, you know, we, we would never have done otherwise. And uh, so I think it is important. And I think also that, uh, you know, for a country like India, you can't rely on agriculture to absorb such large numbers of people. Mm -hmm. It has to move to higher value added, better wages, better uh, lifestyles, etc. And there also, I think, in, you know, the, the industrial policy plays a big role because it, it allows uh, that higher value addition to happen. Uh, 
Well, it's I mean, a massive it's, synergy, isn't it? You get jobs in the sectors that you want while you address the climate challenge. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. Ben. Um, um, so broadly, yes. Uh, the, the words industrial strategy have political loading yes. in this country, so we're not using those at the moment. Um, but in terms of, this isn't a problem that can be done entirely through laissez-faire approach. That's obvious. Yeah. And uh, we're already doing things in the UK and in various other countries where it's fairly remarkable in terms of the approach, not just to industrial sectors, but to place. Yeah. So the way we're thinking about the clusters for carbon capture and storage, that's a very new way to think about the way you put all the incentives around to make a transition in a particular place. Um, and on, you know, on vehicle manufacturing, you know, the government, I won't comment on the history, but the government is move, trying to be very fast to incentivise battery mm. manufacturing now, as you've seen with the investment in cell cells from Jacob Andrew. So um, uh, the, uh, I think it, it, it's a new sense of partnership between industry and government is definitely required. And even though it's not about specific investments in specific sectors or specific places, government has to set out a different approach to how we deal with the infrastructure that industry needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of our huge challenges in the UK is the electricity grid and how we're going to get the investment we need in the places that we need it and with a set of structures for incentives for investment which haven't, and for instance, enabling people to who gets to connect in which sequence when there's competition for, for connection. So that's why the Prime Minister was also talking about the strategic spatial approach to, yeah. to, to grid infrastructure, which is a genuinely new way of doing things and as a, a new, different type of way of government industry. Working. Well, and probably a necessary way of doing things too. And, yeah. and those of you who are interested in um, the grid story, uh, Nick Windsor released yeah. his report, the Energy Networks um, Commissioner, I think the ti his title was, and that's yeah. worth reviewing as a very clear set of recommendations to government. It's UK focused, but of course, many of these issues cut across many countries. Nigel. Can we, just, just on the cut, you know, the, the Tata Group is, is an amazing company, Chandra, who, who's the, you know, had been friends with them for over 30 years. I mean, theirs is an interesting case study. You know, the Jaguar I-Pace, which is their EV car, is manufactured under contract in Austria. Mm. Um, you know, they, they have a big manufacturing facility in the Midlands. We can't link it into the grid to build the battery factory, so we're having to build a battery factory in Somerset. They, you know, who builds it, when and how? It, you know, these decisions could have been taken many years ago, but because the problems of the grid are very long running, and typically it takes seven years in the UK to get, a, get the planning uh, resolved. And some of the, you know, the offshore wind auction was a total failure a few weeks ago. And these have massive ramifications for inward investment into the projects. You know, the Tashi nuclear project in in the Alaman Wales, which you know, ran up costs of two billion before they had to stop it. I mean, that's a, these are all failures of our policy to really be proactive and tough enough. And you know, we can either have hard compulsion or soft compulsion around this sort of stuff. And some things require hard compulsion to really force you know, sticks and carrots that we were talking about earlier is sometimes you do need to use the stick. And actually, the electorate will get used to it when they see it's a, it's a good outcome. You know, I, I had the privilege of interviewing some of the people who hugged trees before the M25 was built. You know, they can't imagine that we wouldn't have the M25 around London, and the chaos would have been caused if we hadn't made the, the, the right decision to, to build it. Well, uh, tree huggers pre the M25, it's a hard thing for me to get my head around. <laughs> um, right, we're going to move broadly to um, Q&A here. I'd like the questions to be um, short, and I'd like them to be questions. Uh, and if you wish to direct them to a particular panel member, then you're welcome to do that. Uh, the theme, again, is synergies, and we are speaking globally here. So um, that's where things are, and I'm waiting to see a hand, and we do. Well, goodness me, yes, okay. you've just beaten <laughs> Vice-Chancellor with apologies, <laughs> Lawrence. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Lawrence Wainwright. Most of our conversation thus far has been looking outwards, but we need to look inside ourselves. There's a spiritual and psychological dimension to all of this. How do we enable the uh, necessary collective consciousness shift in our relationship with nature? Goodness, that's it's a start with a big one. Uh, <laughs> do we have any any deep spiritual thinkers here? <laughs> Nigel, you're yeah. a deep spiritual thinker. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm. You're willing to have a go. I'm, well, I'm willing to have a go because you know I think it's very important to live and walk the values that you believe in. And you know I'm 
uh, a, a lover of nature. I, I live in a one-bedroom rented apartment. I don't, own a ca I don't drive a car. I use public transport. I eat local food. Uh, I like you know, holidaying as much as I can in the, in the UK and try and measure and control my carbon footprint because, uh, you know, I just went on recent holidays that the Lofferton Islands because they're, they're, they're very spiritually uplifting and wonderful place to go on, on holiday and is at the moment unsp unspoiled. Um, but it's, that's a bit of virtue signalling on my, my part. But going back to the education role in, in all of this, you know, why should we really care and when you get the chance to dive in a coral reef which has been completely obliterated or whatever, it's very moving. And often you have to see the negative to really appreciate the positive. And, you know, we, we didn't really talk very much about deforestation, but the scale of deforestation and the, the economic case in the short term for it is really high. And therefore, people are going to continue to do it because there's no subsidy that stops it happening. And it's really economically productive for all the countries in South America. But we have to stop it because it's having a profound impact on, on, the, on, on the world. And we do need a voice, a better and bigger voice from, uh, from nature. I had the privilege of, of following uh, David Attenborough on a, uh, which is a terrible position to happen when you're speaking because he's so brilliant and everything, you just look, you know, somewhere between pathetic and average when you follow him on. But, but we don't really have another spokesperson of that caliber on the, who can actually really make a difference. You know, when you watch him and see, all the years that he's contributed towards a, le a leading position on, on the debate around this. We, we, we haven't a spiritual leader mm. who, who can really present the case of what really, what really matters. You know, we've, we've got you know, Michael Potillo running around on the railways, but we don't have anybody running around nature and telling us all about good things, and, and we do need that. Michael Patillo is a spiritual leader. There's a new, <laughs> new concept. I'm sure he'd be delighted. Just for railways. Okay. Well, maybe um, I can follow up on that. I think it's a very, very good question that you're raising. And I think maybe it could sort of, we could relate it a little bit to the, the crisis that you are, yeah. you know, you're asking for here. Because we actually do have a crisis that's related to the question you are, you're asking. We can see that, again, I'm referring to the, the young students that I've been engaging with for the past three and a half years um, in particular. And uh, we can see, you know, the, the depression, the climate anxiety uh, that is permeating uh, this generation of, of young people. In the little country I come from, uh, Denmark, we see that 10% of the adult population have been in touch with antidepressives. So there's a real, you could say, crisis going on that, that uh, certainly is related to the, the direness of the climate uh, crisis that we are facing in the world. So I do think that we, sh we, we need to take that seriously as well, uh, and also as, as educators. Uh, because at the end of the day, you can sort of say these people will be, you know, voting our governments and make, thereby making the policies. And that could also change the world a little bit, we, for the better, we could hope. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for the question. I um, draw everybody's attention to the wonderful, beautiful gallery of photographs outside of the natural world. We're, we'll be hearing shortly from Princess Hain Aga Khan, who's taken those photos, but actually it is nice sometimes to just look at the amazing beauty of nature and realize what we're at risk of, of losing. I mean, I think the other thing here in terms of changing, um, changing us from the inside is ensuring that collectively a voice is given to those who often don't have a voice. And at the Smith School, and I see Alexis there, and we've been training thousands of young people who are activists to make sure that they are uh, their voice is, is credibly informed so that when they're speaking, they can't be dismissed uh, for not really knowing what's going on. They're as well informed as the people they're speaking to. So I think that, that's an important part of kind of connecting the spirituality and the multi-dimensionality multi of different perspectives with you know, the foundational science and economics to, to affect that sort of change. Right, so you triggered a lot of thought, um, Vice Chancellor, and then I think we've got one over there and another one there and one there. So, and I mean, maybe just to pick up on, on your question, I think in Britain we have a spiritual leader in the national treasure that is David Attenborough, yes. who's been very good at um, championing the importance of nature. So, um, again, somebody that you should connect with. I'm going to ask two questions because I'm going to have to run in yes. a minute, if that's okay. The first is how useful, sadly, as this might be, is... Um, the fact that the health implications of climate change might produce the crisis point in people's minds to affect that behavioural change. There's more rhetoric around the lens of health crisis mm. through climate being maybe how we wake up properly to it. 
So that's one question. And then the second one is in my conversations with students, who of course rightly are very exercised about this, I'm searching and have yet to get the answer, even from my own husband, about what's the what's the actual piece of work or who's doing this piece of work to give me the answers to say, right here, right now, tomorrow, what is it going to take to scale up alternative energy sources in, in literal numbers to meet the energy demands that we have today? Because I'm given, from the students, it's we can do it tomorrow, which is evidently not possible, to going down to visit the fusion plant in our, in our Cullum National Lab and Ian Chapman, who you know, is again developing amazing fusion technologies, saying that to meet current needs, we'd need to build a nuclear power station a day for the next 10 years, and we build one every decade. Now, I'm not saying that that's advocating for nuclear, that's just the example, he'll give it in panels. So, so when we've got these extremes of views, and we need to have a conversation and to wake people up, I do think facts like that need to be worked out, there needs to be consensus in the community, because I've yet to get that data and that consensus, and it's everything from that extreme to that extreme, because then we can start to have, I think, a more mature conversation about the feasibility of what's the workforce we need to deliver that, who's going to do it, and who's going to pay it. But whilst we talk in these extreme ranges, it's very hard to have a rational argument, I find. So I just say that as a scientist from outside the field. Yeah, well, somebody give me the answer, and can well, you all agree on what that answer is? Um, I suspect no is the answer, but I, I, would, I would love personally, I'm not supposed to do this as chair, but I'd love to pick up on your second question. And I think part of the, uh, part of the challenge with those sorts of stats, the, the, the reason they feel so um, confusing is that actually the, these are exponential growth processes. And so saying to get from here to here and drawing a straight line and saying we need to build X per year is not the right way of thinking about it. If you think about it as we need a growth rate of X percent per annum, then what looks, you know, it's the beauty of compound interest. Uh, what looks impossible today looks entirely plausible in five years' time. So, you know, when people say we've got to go five times faster, we're not going to make it. Actually, or, or to take another example, so the UAE have said, we're going to try and triple renewables by 2030. You know, big, hairy target. That is a slower rate of growth than what we've had for the last oh. decade, right? So you, just, you just need to put these numbers into this kind of growth perspective, I think, to get your, your head around them. And I think Ian's right that we won't build a nuclear plant every, uh, every week. Uh, but then I think that's probably because building a nuclear plant every week isn't the answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. OK. Uh, any other? Um, that was a reaction on the second of your question. Um, it, it, it's a, a, very relevant question, and I've sat in on a number of debates with the Prime Ministers and whatever for over 30 years on trying to get some consensus on that. And if you remember, Gordon Brown announced, let's build eight, eight nuclear power stations in 2008, and Boris virtually made the same announcement in 2022. We'd managed to build one in the interim uh, period over the, those, those years. And they're very difficult to do and very expensive to do and produce hugely expensive energy which will make us globally uncompetitive to, to do that. And therefore, my personal view, in, in terms of the view that we've taken, we are not going to invest in nuclear fission. We are investing in nuclear fusion, including the two great projects here at, uh, at, at Oxford, because that's such a game changer. And you know, MIT is doing an amazing job as well, and Oxford and MIT, two universities I'm particularly fond of for different reasons. And I think they will crack that, and that's, you know, and what's been, what we haven't talked about, the, the supply side on solar and renewables is off the scale good compared to every projection we have. It's so much cheaper to produce this stuff than anybody dreamed of 10 or 15 years ago. And I think the same is going to happen. It, it, if, if we want energy to be very cheap, we can make it very cheap. If we want very, energy to be very expensive so we don't use it, we can make it very expensive. And we've, we've got to, at a macro level, decide which route we want to go down. On, quickly, on the, the preventative health care, which is really what we want to do, we've failed miserably on that across the world. And as, as a life insurer, we, you know, we, we insure tr trillions of, of value in, in life across the U UK and the US, the biggest life insurer in the UK, one of the biggest in, in America. And what we're seeing is people dying. They're dying out, out of choice, that they're actually making very poor health choices 
around what they eat, how they exercise, what drugs they take, both prescription drugs and um, what, what are called recreational drugs, but are not really, <laughs> they kill you, uh, sorts of drugs. And therefore, I don't have that much confidence that we can change behaviours around the threat around health. A few of us will get, uh, will agree with that, but actually we already agree with everything. So the universe of new consumers you get as a consequence of that, I think, will be very, very small. I mean, there are so many health effects from climate, ranging from early death from particulate matter from burning fossil fuels to heat-related deaths. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic, I think, than Nigel is. I'm jumpshed. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on, you know, lethal heat and heat death in India. You, of course, have a huge cooling uh, business, so you're hopefully saving some lives there. But, but I think, and, and various members of the Smith School are collaborating with um, departments in public health and other, other you know, um, areas within Oxford that, um, that are looking at these synergies because I think they are uh, an important... I mean, I think people care about their own health perhaps not as much as we'd like them to, but perhaps more than they care about the environment somewhere over the other side of the world. Would you...? Well, I, you know... I think in India, the two big challenges, one is air pollution uh, from emissions, uh, and the other one is on heat. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about air pollution, and uh, Arunaba is here and he's written about it, people get excited about it only when it's very, very high. You know, the rest of the year, when the air pollution is not so high, they don't get excited about it. And so, you know, the public policy doesn't respond adequately to that. Mm -hmm. But lots of young people and old people are dying from air pollution all the time. And we are not that concerned about it. It doesn't seem to become a big issue for the public or the government, you know, whereas it should be, because just from the numbers of people who are dying from air pollution. Heat is, I think, you know, it's a sort of an emerging idea now that the planet is warming. You are going to get areas of extreme heat where you know, uh, supporting life is going to be very, very difficult. I'm not sure if we can you know, say that cooling is going to save that. Mm. But certainly the demand for cooling overall, especially in a country like India, which is already quite hot, you know, is just going to grow exponentially. So as it is with growth, you get huge demand on energy. Mm. Plus, you're going to get additional demand on top of that for the cooling that's going to come. So I think, you know, unless the renewables can keep up and, and really accelerate, uh, I don't see how we're going to solve this, uh, this very, very difficult problem. So we have a feedback between the two parts of your question. Uh, health to scaling renewable energy to provide the cooling so that we don't then fry <coughs> ourselves with more fossil fuels, etc. Um, now we've got some more questions. Uh, there's, uh, somebody has a mic and, uh, goodness, yes. Hello, um, I'm one of the students, hopefully. Welcome. <laughs> um, so I was trying to ask a question specifically because we were talking about the state of urgency and especially our ingenuity that's starting when we're in a moment of crisis. And there's been a lot of studies showing that um, that sense of urgency and crisis helps for low-cost mitigation strategies for climate change. But maybe what I was wondering is, um, what are your thoughts on more of a sense of responsibility instead of that perceived crisis? Mm. And if in the industry world we were to actually give responsibility to someone and in a long-term responsibility specifically, how, how would that work and, and who should take on that responsibility in the long term? Great. And let's take a few others if we're running short on time. Can we have some roving? Yes, great. Thank you. I'd love to, um, hi, Richard McKinney, I'd love to know what you think, in your opinion, what the top three financial mechanisms are that could provide both market competitiveness and climate resilience. Okay, super, nice, short and quick. And then the third one here, I think I, we have a... Oh, my next. I, I had actually a specific question for Jamshid and Ben. Both uh, UK and Indian government face election next year. So I'm going to try and phrase this in a way that you both feel able to answer, which is given the, the challenge of certainty of investment that's been mentioned by the panel, and given the, I think, Ben, as you put it, the, the feeling that you have to take people with you on that journey, 
as you look at the next government, which may be the same government, but let's say the next government, what are the pieces of advice on those two issues that you would give with what you have seen? Okay, let's take those three in reverse order. So advice for the next government on taking people with you in the UK and in India. Yeah, Ben. Shall I go? I, um, uh, don't worry, we haven't written it yet. Uh, that's what the advice for a new administration would be. Um, uh, I think the interesting thing about the last week in the UK is in terms of the politics of it, it's probably changed the weather a bit, if you know what I mean, because you'd have seen that getting very specific, the Labour Party um, have come out and said they would reserve some, reverse some specific things, like the, the vehicles. They haven't said it across the piece. And there's kind of a hard political reality that needs to be confronted. So I think, actually, whatever the outcome of the election, the fundamentals of this, our advice will be fairly similar. Um, the advice to administration after they've won an election, uh, you always have a slightly different space for the conversation than you do for ministers worried about facing an election. Yeah? So uh, all of us who are in public... Um, administration know that really tough decisions you try and take early in a parliament. Yeah? So um, uh, rest assured that the right advice will be ready and provided to whatever form of government we get after the election in terms of both urgent short-term action that's required and the longer-term trajectories. I, I don't think I can really say much more than that. Um, do you want to keep on this issue? or do you want to Well, I was just going to be cheeky and suggest that you ask the first question. You know, what would it look like if somebody took responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I mean, individual responsibility is what really matters, right? That's what you're trying to get to. And going back to some of the points at the beginning about, you know, our limitations as a species and how all our incentives have devised, you've got to find an intermediation between those deep-rooted psychological things and the macro issue that we're all facing collectively. Now, people are trying to do that with clear mechanisms. People have talked about personal carbon budgets, you know, so you have a carbon budget as well as a financial budget. Um, I don't think any of that's at all workable practically or politically or socially, to be honest with you. So it comes through, it has to come through in softer ways and education and links to two of the things we've been talking about. I think biodiversity and health are really important mm. for making that link. But in the end, it's something that needs to be a sense of responsibility and understanding that is innate in your head and is ingrained deeply rather than a superficial policy instrument to try and make that link. That's the best answer that I've got for that one. Great. I would like to point yeah. uh, sort of the discussion back to the, the good question from you, and thank you for that, to the CEOs of the world, because these are actually human beings yeah. placed in the businesses. And we have really great research showing that, in particular in family-owned businesses, actually, yeah. who allow themselves to have a long-term perspective on how to change the world. And uh, having that long-term perspective in family-owned businesses you know, in, in that research will show that they also make the decisions that are more societally oriented than the short-termism I was talking about before. But, but again, I think that we also see new research in the, from a sociological, anthropological stance, even in the management scene, that has to do with the CEO as a political activist. And that is a contentious area to step into as a CEO. We, I mean, we also have research showing that 20 years ago we had a lot of companies ask, uh, arguing, we are apolitical. We are non-political. We don't take a stance. We are here for what we do best, jobs, products, processes, whatever we produce. Whereas today we see that even taking a stance on sustainability, on climate, also comes with a kind of responsibility that is sometimes often very politically oriented. You take a stance on do you believe or do you not believe. Now I've been living in the United States for the past three and a half years, and here, as you know, there's a very strong divide in that country. Do you believe or do you not believe in climate change being man-made? And that sort of creates different kinds of CEO speak as well. So those CEOs, and with them not just the CEO, but of course the business executive, stepping up, taking a stance, daring to even divide the consumers and maybe you know, say goodbye to some consumers, at least for a while, uh, we see them attracting a lot of the talent I was speaking about before, because that's where a lot of our young people want to work. So there's also that kind of dimension, and, and of course, uh, you know, that, that attracting talent is important. But again, I think we also have to say that policy is very, very important, but sometimes we actually see businesses moving faster, mm. quicker, with more resources, doing the research that is needed, questioning, you know, are we doing research sufficiently fast enough at our universities? Because businesses are actually doing it. So I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, wanting also, you know, to remind ourselves that we do have businesses that are really out there on the cutting edge, 
wanting to even move faster than our policymakers, our policymakers that may last for four years, or, and then they're out, or maybe they withdraw, as we've seen, some of their earlier promises, whilst the businesses still move on, because they have a commitment uh, to uh, whatever they have put in place in terms of research and development and produce uh, whatever product they're producing. So I think that there is a, there is a really interesting movement going on in, uh, in the business agenda, in the private sector, on, on these issues we're talking about. Yeah, Mena, I, and one of the things you love, I'm sure, about being director of the Smith School is how we do serve as a bit of a magnet for leading businesses in this space. And we just launched a report with Unilever, and I see Paul Polman in the audience there. Uh, at at, at uh, Climate Week in New York, we have leading financial institutions, Uber Kelez there, uh, Abed Kamali from Bank of America and from Lombard Odia in reverse order, uh, and Guy is somewhere here from Marex. Who, so so the, one of the nice things about where we are is businesses will come, and financial institutions will come to us and say, we want to push the boundaries here help us. How do we do the research? How do we engage with government? And it's a, a, the students who have just joined us, you'll find this to be a great joy too, working with those businesses. But even the shareholder activists, now we talk about yeah. CEO activism, we also yeah. see that shareholder engagement, mm. if we like, but we can also call it shareholder activism, because these are also human beings yes. who are concerned, who want to change the world. And that is, that is again, we have great research showing that it's not moving fast enough, but it's an emer emerging sort of area that, uh, that I look forward to following. Great. I'd like Cressida's question um, to be put to drum shade. Well, I will do that. So if you're advising Prime Minister Modi, um, uh, or, or perhaps uh, the next government in India, what would, you, what would you be suggesting? What would you be asking for? How would you be steering India? Well, I think you know that we have an election coming next year, general election. And uh, at this stage, the polls all indicate that, you know, there will be continuity uh, in the government. But I think that if you look at the type of uh, ambition that uh, Prime Minister Modi and the government have actually already talked about, you know, whether it's to do with renewables, whether it's to do with hydrogen, you know, making solar panels in India, I mean, there's been a lot of ambition uh, mm. in this area. I think the, the, I don't think there's a lack of ambition, uh, but I think the implementation now is where the real issues are. And uh, I think we've got to understand that the global supply chain for all of this uh, type of uh, uh, intervention is, is not in India, mm. you know, and we have to bring it to India, essentially. Uh, only then will we be able to move it. For instance, I mean, just as an aside from climate, I mean, cell phones, you know, were just imported into India. And now we're assembling them in India, but you know, there's a very, very high import content. But the plan is that over the next five to 10 years, you reduce that import content to as low as you can and make it all, all the supply in India. So the supply chain actually accounts for much more in value, in emissions, you know, in, all, in the entire supply. So measuring that scope three supply chain and, and making sure that it's you know, not imported into India is, I think, very critical. Do you think, um, so some would cheer this sense that every country wants to have a piece of the action and there's a bit of a competitive dynamic, the race to zero, India is saying, China, you can't take it all, we're going to do it too. Or would you say actually global cooperation, supply chain, efficient, cheap production, using the comparative advantages of every country, trading with each other is the best way to get to zero? I mean, it's fairly clear we're moving into the former space, whether we like it or not. But do we lose something by doing that? You definitely do. So I think you have to find that balance. Mm. It's difficult uh, to, to state what the balance is. But today, it's very skewed against India in the supply chain. Mm. So developing countries need to be much more part of the supply chain from a global perspective. And specifically for India, as I mentioned, that because we've never looked at export-led growth, as being the, the real driver for growth. Now, Nigel, um, the question that I'm sure you're anticipating I'm going to direct to you uh, is the one on the top three financial um, interventions or, or uh, metrics for, for climate resilience. Uh, can you have a go, go at that one, please? Yeah, well, I mean, there's many ways of, to, to construct the metrics around, around that because you want to deliver outcomes. And personally, I want 
to see consumers change their outcomes and get more engaged in the climate debate. And that's why I'm such a huge fan of retrofitting housing, because actually it starts to get people to measure and monitor mm -hmm. and pay for it, because I'm, I'm pretty convinced with the changes in technology would be self-financing and actually wouldn't be an economic burden to do, to, um, to, to, to do that. Um, I, I would go heavy on, on renewable energy um, in, in solar and, and wind in the, across the world. And, and try and accelerate the, the removal of, of coal in, in particular. And the economics are, are there now for, for, for doing that. And that, I think, is a, a big change that we, we, could, um, we, we could easily, easily, make, easily make happen if we chose to do it. Because the coal producers and the coal consumers like China and Poland and, and the likes are very sticky still. And until we stop them being sticky and people can see a new world emerging that's better than the world that they had before, because seeing is believing in a, a lot of this stuff. Um, I'd really tr like to get the smartest companies in the world, the tech companies, to step up a bit because they're like the hidden producers and consumers of, of energy. And, and because every time we use our mobile phone, we never think of the on costs that, that, we, that we get and the massive data centers that have been built. And they, we need to figure out how do, how do we stop the massive production of energy through all of that, which is something that's not baked in to the, the ecosystem anywhere at all right, right now. And the growth of AI in particular is going to result in explosion of energy usage mm -hmm. around that. And we're not really measuring new emerging industries and getting, you know, the, the, the Microsofts and the, the Googles and the Amazons who, who indirectly produce a lot of stuff and do a lot of virtue signaling, but the net, the net effect is they're producing masses of energy. Well, I feel like saying, if I may, watch this space uh, for tech and the Smith School in the coming, coming year, um, and I'm just going to leave that hanging. We are, we are fast running out of time. In fact, basically, we are done. But... But I'm going to be quite unorthodox, if that's all right, um, unusually for me. Um, and I wanted to pick up the questions, because there are a lot of hands with questions that didn't get asked. I like to ask the questions and not answer them, because I think sometimes the question is as valuable as the answer. So can I have a show of hands who had a question that wasn't picked up? So let's just do one, two, three <laughs> here, and then we'll call it quits for this session. And, and perhaps if you want to answer the question, you can find the questioner. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank Hello. you. It's quite convenient not to answer it because it's for you and Mete. Um, <laughs> it's great to be in a university talking about hearing the topic of the skills gap coming up. A lot of people talking about that at the moment. Um, I think you said you educate 20 people. You, was it 20 or 40? I can't remember. So, and you had 1,000 applicants. We, we this is one of the biggest universities in the UK, in Europe, one of the most prestigious universities. Is there a plan to scale that up and get yes. more people going through the system? So we do over 100,000 digitally. And uh, under Meta's tenure, I've got no doubt we'll be doing 100 million uh, before Excellent. it's done. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Right. Th but thanks, Harlow. You're quite right. Um, the, twi the 29 Alex. are the master of science of sustainability. Yes. These are the elite of the elite, some of whom are in the room. And you're, you're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much. My name is Alexis McGivern. I work for the Smith School. Thank you, Cameron, for the shout out to our youth training program. Meta, my question is for you. You mentioned there's 70 million people graduating each year in the disciplines of law, accounting, um, business, and that those people are being taught skills about shareholder and profit maximization, that we should change that within educational institutions. I wonder what levers that educational institutions can pull in order to change what recruiters are asking for, what businesses are actually demanding, because I think a big reason why they're teaching that skills is because those skills are still really highly sought after. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts uh, about how we change that. That's a great question. I'd love to talk to you about that one too, but let's move on. Gideon. Thank you. I'm Gideon Henderson. Um, some of my question has been answered already, but I was struck by uh, Meta's comment that, uh, that, uh, that it's really shareholder value that still drives a lot of thinking, a lot of education. My question was really around the tension between what academics talk about, which is social license to operate of companies, mm -hmm. and what the NGOs say, which is often about it's all greenwashing and it's not a change at all. 
and how we can actually get um, companies to more rapidly really buy into uh, the idea that you, you, it should not just be about um, the, the shareholder return, although that's clearly important, whether shareholder pressure, whether public discourse, whether academic papers are the way to move the debate. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll leave that one. Those oh, hanging. Difficult. We, yeah, they're hard <laughs> questions. Well, well done, me leaving them till the end. And we'll, we'll leave. And Maisa, one last one. I'm, we're just, this is really self-indulgent now. <laughs> Sorry. Very short. So I think I've, we have heard a lot about to address climate change. We need the whole government approach and underlying of the conversation also a whole society approach. Mm. Now, a whole society approach, which means inclusivity, will this help us or hinder, or how do we do that it does not end up in trade-off conversation, but in synergy conversation? Mm. So. Great. Well, you should definitely engage with Ben as a civil servant and the minister. Uh, you can see what you might learn from one another in a synergistic fashion over the break. But I'd like to call this panel to a close. Thank you very much, Nigel, Jamshid, Netta, and Ben.